welcome back guys now in this video let's discuss about preterm labor and preterm premature rupture of membranes now let's start with the topic of preterm labor now before discussing preterm labor let's see what exactly is term okay so usual term is the time period between 37 to 42 weeks okay so 37 to 42 weeks are considered as normal term so before 37 weeks if labor is getting started then it is known as a preterm labor after 42 weeks if labor is happening that is post term labor or post dated pregnancy so what is the usual term usual term is between 37 weeks to 42 weeks okay even in this normal term please concentrate here 37 to 39 weeks are considered as early term 39 to 42 weeks are considered as full term pregnancy now post 42 weeks we have already discussed that is post term pregnancy and before 37 weeks it is known as a preterm labor so very important mcq is preterm labor is labor pains are getting initiated before 37 weeks okay or we can say before 259 days now before 33 weeks if labor pains are initiating definitely we are going to call it as preterm labor why because before 37 anything is preterm labor even in that before 33 weeks very early period if labor pains are getting started then it is known as early preterm labor if labor pains are between 33 so 34 to 36 weeks in this period 34 to 36 weeks if labor pains are getting started then it is known as late preterm labor okay so these are the definitions okay now after seeing the definitions let's see what are the causes or risk factors for the preterm labor why labor pains are getting started why a female is going into labor at a very early period okay that is before 37 weeks now the most common cause of a preterm labor is idiopathic apart from this the other important risk factors are history of a preterm labor. If a female is having a history of preterm labor, then she is also more likely to have a preterm labor this time. Infections, okay, with group B streptococcus. See, GBS infections, usually they increase the levels of hyaluronidase. That hyaluronidase in turn will increase the contractions, okay. I am not going in detail, but infections with group B streptococcus increases the hyaluronidase levels that ultimately causes the uterine contractions and that can lead to preterm labor okay now not only GBS infections like uh, infections that leading to chorioamnionitis uh, okay so chorioamnionitis can also lead to preterm labor see what happens in chorioamnionitis in the condition of chorioamnionitis there will be inflammation and that inflammation will lead to production of interleukins especially interleukin 6 interleukin 8 tumor necrosis factor alpha all these factors interleukins ultimately helps in uterine contractions such uterine contractions can lead to preterm labor okay now let's see what are the causative organisms of chorioamnionitis see they will definitely asking you which of the following organisms are responsible for chorioamnionitis? There are many organisms which can lead to chorioamnionitis, but this set of organisms are very important. Okay, see these organisms include Gardnerella vaginalis, Chlamydia, Gonorrhea, E. coli, Ureoplasma, Ureolyticum, and Mycoplasma hominis. See, out of them, these are very important: Mycoplasma hominis, Ureoplasma, Ureolyticum, Gardnerella vaginalis. Okay, these are the organisms which are very important. So these organisms can lead to chorioamnionitis that is the infection of the placenta that leads to production of interleukins and that interleukins can cause uterine contractions that leads to preterm labor okay before 37 weeks this can happen now there is also a very important mcq they will ask you how you will put the diagnosis of chorioamnionitis okay so we know that chorioamnionitis can predispose a pregnancy to preterm labor but how to put the diagnosis of chorioamnionitis see there are there is this diagnostic criteria at least out of the following two should be present okay any two of the following should be present then you can say that a female is having chorioamnionitis during the pregnancy now she should be having foul smelling vaginal discharge per vaginum 
uh, increase WBC count that is the leukocytosis for any infection leukocytes will go up right. So increase in CRP levels okay C-reactive protein levels because of the inflammation C-reactive proteins are getting increased how much more than 2.7 milligrams per deciliter okay increase in the CRP you should think about chorioamnionitis with the foul smelling vaginal discharge leukocytosis all this stuff okay. Now increase pulse rate and uterine tenderness if a female is having any of Two, okay, any of the two from the following, then you can say that she is having chorioamnionitis. Now, what we are discussing, we are discussing the causes or the risk factors of preterm labor. What is the most important or the what is the most common cause of preterm labor? It's the idiopathic. Apart from that, previous history of preterm labor can lead to preterm labor in the current pregnancy. Infections can lead to preterm labor. Now, let's see a few more important causes for the preterm labor okay there are uh, many causes actually now let's discuss one by one see here other causes from the maternal side include okay during not during exactly okay maternal history okay if a mother is having any of the following then she is more likely to end up with the preterm labor okay that's what i mean by see extremes of age if a mother is a very young girl or she is a very elderly female okay so extremes of age is a risk factor for a preterm labor a short stature is a risk factor a poverty or low socioeconomic status if she is a, if she is in a low socioeconomic status of poverty uh, she is not going to have that much proper hygiene and if she is uh, not taking care during pregnancy that can lead to infections that infections can lead to chorioamnionitis that chorioamnionitis can lead to preterm labor okay see art art means artificial reproductive techniques see if, if she is going for the artificial reproductive techniques then she might end up with a multifetal gestation okay we all know multifetal gestation with the twins and triplets there is a lot of chances of preterm labor okay see twins and triplets they cause premature rupture of membranes if there is premature rupture of membranes that definitely causes the preterm labor right so in that way artificial reproductive techniques very important mcq if a female is undergoing artificial reproductive techniques okay if she is going through this art she will end up as multifetal uh, pregnant okay she will be having this multifetal gestation that multifetal gestation can lead to preterm labor okay that's what i mean by see previous history of preterm labor we have already seen this cervical surgeries like uh, cervical coniation like you know we have already discussed in the topic of uh, cervical cancer see if there is uh, this cervical intraepithelial neoplasia then we are going to do the coniation now whenever you do or uh, whenever you cause a trauma to the cervix during the process of coniation now this cervix is not competent enough to close during the pregnancy so with the increase in gestational age this cervix can dilate and that can lead to preterm labor okay so cervical surgery is like a coniation okay so coniation can lead to preterm labor now stress stress like depression or anxiety now whenever a female is in stress during pregnancy that stress will automatically increase the cortisol okay cortisol is a stress hormone right so this cortisol can lead to uterine contractions true so stress can lead to preterm labor uterine anomalies can lead to preterm labor okay uterine anomalies like uh, uniconvate uterus biconvate uterus septate uterus these uterine anomalies can lead to preterm labor true now maternal diabetes mellitus maternal hypertension maternal stress okay maternal autoimmune diseases periodontal diseases very important mcq okay periodontal diseases malnutrition or any chronic disease any of them can lead to preterm labor see i know i am repeating but this area is of utmost importance okay there are many instances where they have asked the questions like you know all of the following are the risk factors of preterm labor so you should know okay so these are the maternal risk factors what does i mean by a mother is having a history of any of them okay so during pregnancy if mother is having any of this okay right now see during pregnancy if mother is having uterine over distension okay uterus is getting distended what is the reason why uterus is getting over distended might be because of what twins or triplets that is a multifetal gestation or might be because of hydramnios or polyhydramnios if there is too much amount of fluid that causes uterine distension or uh, too many babies cause uterine distension so that can lead to preterm labor why because with uterine distension there is increase in caps caps means contractile associated proteins okay contraction associated proteins uh, grp means a gastric related peptide and crh means corticotropic releasing hormone see with 
you try now a distension these things okay these things are going to increase in the body and these things will cause the uterine contractions whenever there are uterine contractions before 37 weeks that's a preterm labor that's it okay now so cervical incompetence cervix is getting dilated okay cervix is getting dilated that can lead to preterm labor preeclampsia gestational hypertensive disorders like a preeclampsia can lead to that and antepartum hemorrhages might be because of uh, placenta previa or abruptio placenta can lead to preterm labor and premature rupture of membranes and intrauterine death all of them are risk factors for preterm labor okay you should know them very important area now after saying the causes of preterm labor now let's discuss how to put the diagnosis of preterm labor first okay now a female of uh, 32 weeks of gestation comes to you and like uh, she is saying that she is having the uterine contractions okay uh, she is having a, a very no, it's not, definitely she is not going to say that i am having uterine contractions she will say you know i am having very painful tender uterus okay it's very much painful now how to put the diagnosis that she is going into a preterm labor now see if she is having four contractions in 20 minutes or eight contractions within one hour okay so these are the diagnostic criteria four contractions within 20 minutes or eight contractions within one hour now we can say that she is going into preterm labor now along with that you have done the perspiculum examination where you see that cervix is getting dilated now cervix is three centimeters dilated some books mention it is uh, one centimeter dilated two centimeter dilated now usually the more appropriate value is if the cervix is more than three centimeters dilated with 80 percent effacement okay now cervix is dilated and it is getting effaced which means she is going into labor okay now along with that the length of the cervix very very important one okay a lot of times this question has been asked okay the length of the cervix is very small the cervical length is getting smaller and smaller now it is less than 2.5 centimeter this is the best answer okay so cervical length cervix is getting smaller and smaller which means she is going into labor we all know that cervical length decreases during labor cervical effacement will happen cervical dilation will happen the, if the cervical length is less than 2.5 centimeter or 25 millimeters okay less than 25 millimeters then we can say that she is going into labor now fetal fibronectin see if you can see this fetal fibronectin in cervical vaginal fluids how much more than 50 nanograms per ml let me tell you what exactly is this fetal fibronectin first see this fetal fibronectin is a glue like substance which is present between the fetal membranes and the decidua for example this is the decidua this is the endometrium of the mother during the pregnancy now this is the these are the fetal membranes now in between the fetal membranes and in between the decidua there is this glue like substance which is holding the interface actually this Fetal fibronectin is not seen in the cervicovaginal fluids. But whenever you see this, whenever there is this distension happening, whenever the labor is happening, this fetal fibronectin is going to leak out into the cervicovaginal fluids. So, presence of fetal fibronectin in the cervicovaginal fluids, how much more than? More than 50 nanograms per ml. This is the MCQ. Okay. So it's an indicative that she is going into labor. Now, what are the important points about fetal fibronectin? Fetal fibronectin, it's a glycoprotein, which is also known as a trophoblastic glue. Okay, it is present between uh, decidua of the mother and the fetal membranes. It is a holding together. Okay, whenever the labor is happening, whenever there is like, you know, uh, separation, the leakage. Okay, now from here, from this interface, this fetal fibronectin is going to leak into the cervical vaginal fluids more than 50 nanograms per uh, ml okay more than 50 nanograms per ml is a indicative that she is going into labor okay it binds the fetal membranes to decidua okay we have seen now after this let's talk about what are the signs predicting okay what are the signs predicting the preterm labor okay right now she is not having any uh, contractions but by just looking at certain signs we can predict that she will end up in the preterm labor most likely so this is a prediction so what are these predicting signs see if you do transvaginal sonography okay now she is uh, coming to your clinic for the regular checkup normal regular checkup you have done the transvaginal sonography and in this normal transvaginal sonography if you see this cervix if you see her cervix which is very short okay less than 2.5 centimeters then you can predict that she will end up in the 
preterm labor now funneling of cervix actually what is the normal shape of cervix guys the normal shape of cervix is a t shape okay it will be t shape okay cervix this is a cervical canal the cervical canal is in t shape okay let me show you here for example see this is the cervix here is the uterus so above is the uterus and these are the membranes here will be the membrane so what is the usual shape of the cervix the cervical canal shape is usually t shape okay it's a t shape the canal is like you know it's a longitudinal thing it's a it's a t shape but whenever this cervix is getting funneled or whenever the cervical os is getting dilated what happens it will turn to y shape first okay it will turn to y shape later it will turn to v shape further it will turn to u shape so this is cervical funneling with the cervical os dilation so whenever you do this transvaginal sonography and you see this funneling of the cervix it's going towards the u shape then you can say that she will end up as a preterm labor so this is also a predicting sign so very important mcqs short cervix means a cervix less than 2.5 cm now they will ask you do ask you the order okay the sequence of cervical dilation actually it is a t shape later it will shape, it will turn into y shape v v shape and u shape okay now uh, bishop score you all know this bishop score we have already discussed this bishop score greater than 4 is an indicator to that she can go into labor now increase levels of interleukin 6 8 tnf alpha we have already discussed this in the topic of a chorioretinitis just before we have discussed right whenever there is chorioretinitis there will be production of this interleukins especially interleukin 6 interleukin 8 and tumor necrosis factor alpha um, matrix metalloproteases interleukin 1 also sometimes see these are the predictors that she can end up as preterm labor okay and the presence of a fetal fibronectin yes now if you see the fetal fibronectin more than 50 nanograms per ml in the cervical vaginal fluids in which period this period okay 22 to 37 weeks actually during this 22 to 37 weeks there is no fetal fibronectin in the cervical vaginal fluids which means before 22 weeks before 22 weeks and after 37 weeks presence of fetal fibronectin is something normal okay very very important point before 22 weeks and after term after 37 weeks this fetal fibronectin is normally physiologically present in the cervical vaginal fluids but in this period 22 to uh, 37 weeks if you see the cervical vaginal fluid if you in the cervical vaginal fluid if you see this fetal fibronectin then it is a predictor sign that she will end up as preterm labor okay now please concentrate uh, this fetal fibronectin a few important points whenever you see this fetal fibronectin in 30 percent of the cases okay in 30 percent of the cases within the next one week okay within the next one week she will go into preterm labor and in 40 percent of the cases okay preterm labor will happen in the upcoming next two weeks okay now so presence of a genital tract infections it's a predictive sign for preterm labor yes we have already discussed that now after this let's see how to prevent the preterm labor okay we have seen what are the risk factors of preterm labor how to predict the preterm labor what is the diagnosis of preterm labor now let's talk about yes there are certain predictor signs now there are certain risk factors okay she is having a history of preterm labor now what we can do to prevent preterm labor in this current pregnancy okay now what we can do is we can give her progesterone okay so we can give a progesterone to her to prevent the preterm labor that's the one thing which we can do apart from that we can do cervical circlage see if she, in her history if in her history if she is having cervical incompetence okay because of cervical incompetence if she is having preterm labor in her history we can do circlage okay we can do encirclage that's a mcdonald's stage or shirodkar stage we can do okay so circlage can be done and very important mcq is when we have to do the circlage okay usually it is done uh, by 12 weeks but the circlage should not be done after uh, 28 weeks okay usually circlage is done by 12 weeks that's a very important mcq now circlage is done for short cervix yes whenever there is cervical incompetence history of cervical incompetence or right now she is having short cervix and also she is having a history of cervical incompetence okay see please concentrate here now she is having short cervix along with short cervix she is also having a history of cervical incompetence leading to preterm labor or abortion now what we can do is we can put a encircage okay now the very important point sir have we used any antibiotics no so to prevent preterm labor antibiotics are not used antibiotics does not have any role 
now bed rest does not have any good role okay bed, bed rest is not beneficial and cervical pessaries are not effective i am saying this why because these are the questions previously asked okay cervical pessaries are they anyway helpful in preventing the preterm labor no bed rest no and antibiotics have no role see we will start antibiotics only when we know okay there is infection happening so what we have to do recto vaginal swab is taken okay in all the cases of preterm labor okay if you are suspecting preterm labor in all the cases of preterm labor what we will be doing is recto vaginal swab is taken in all cases of preterm labor if it comes positive if it's coming positive then we are going to give the antibiotics otherwise antibiotics are not indicated are not given okay so this is a very very important this is a image based question this can be asked here what is happening is like you know this pursed suture see this is a mcdonald's suture mcdonald's suture done for the encerclage procedure now see if there is this preterm labor happening okay labor happening before 37 weeks what's the main complication see what happens if labor is happening before 37 weeks what happen means it's just that preterm labor can lead to respiratory distress syndrome in the baby why because before term lungs are not fully matured okay lung maturation have started by 34 weeks okay but lungs are not completely matured okay they are not 100 percent matured so the complication of preterm labor is respiratory distress syndrome or the hyaline membrane disease in the baby now let's talk a few important points about the surfactant you all guys know you have studied in the physiology that this surfactant okay this surfactant is the one which is helping in the maturation of the fetal lungs see surfactant is synthesized by type 2 pneumocytes or type 2 alveolar cells in the lungs there are two types of cells type 1 alveolar cells type 2 alveolar cells or type 2 pneumocytes this type 2 pneumocytes are the ones by 34 weeks they will produce this surfactant now what happens if surfactant is decreased now if surfactant decrease means that causes uh, sorry if what what exactly the surfactant decreases this surfactant decreases the alveolar surface tension which means in an alveoli there is this air water interface okay see let me show you here if this is the alveolus the alveolus is lined by the water and definitely air will also be there so whenever or wherever there is air water interface that creates surface tension of forces now this surface tension is a collapsing force so the fetal lungs are in a collapsed state now this type 2 alveolar cells what they are doing this type 2 alveolar cells they are producing a substance known as surfactant now this surfactant will come in between it will come and sit in between the air and water so whenever it taken down the interface between air and water okay now it's like you know totally separating the air and water so there is no air water interface Whenever there is no air water interface, there is no surface tension. Whenever there is no surface tension, the fetal lungs are now going to be matured. Okay. So, surfactant, it decreases the alveolar surface tension pressures. So, absence of surfactant, it leads to what? The absence of surfactant leads to respiratory distress syndrome where there is too much amount of this uh, alveolar surface tension which causes the collapsing of the fetal lungs. Okay. So, this is a few these are the some few important points about the surfactant now let's see what are the two important components of the surfactant what exactly is the surfactant surfactant is a lipid okay by nature it's a mainly a lipid so what are the two main components the two main components are uh, phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylglycerol okay phosphatidylcholine it accounts for almost 80 percent and phosphatidylglycerol it is 15 percent very important mcq from physio the two important components of surfactant or phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylglycerol important point is this phosphatidylglycerol it's present only in the amniotic fluid okay it's present only in the amniotic fluid now what is this only present in amniotic fluid sir see this is having certain importance okay we will discuss now this phosphatidylcholine it is present in amniotic fluid it is present in maternal serum it is present in fetal serum but phosphatidylglycerol it is only present in amniotic fluid so in amniotic fluid if you can see this phosphatidylglycerol presence of this phosphatidylglycerol which means surfactants are getting produced in the baby so that's the reason why this phosphatidylglycerol is coming into the amniotic fluid so by looking at the phosphatidylglycerol in the amniotic fluid you can come to a conclusion that lungs are getting matured 
okay so that we will discuss in the next slide anyway okay so the final indicator of lung maturity is checking the phosphatidyl glycerol presence in the amniotic fluid okay this is a best test okay now not only this test there are also few other tests which will come up in the exams now let's see what are the lung maturation test or the test which can tell you that the fetal lungs are actually mature now we have seen one test what is that presence of phosphatidyl glycerol in the amniotic fluid that's a one test apart from that let's see are there any other test yes there are see lecithin sphingomyelin ratio okay now lecithin sphingomyelin ratio in the amniotic fluid if it's more than 2 okay lecithin sphingomyelin ratio more than 2 it indicates lung maturity okay the ratio of lecithin to sphingomyelin if it's more than 2 it indicates the fetal lungs are mature less than 2 fetal lungs are not mature okay now phosphatidyl glycerol presence in the amniotic fluid yes we have discussed that phosphatidyl glycerol is only present in the amniotic fluid that's the best test okay now so shake test or bubble test now you have collected the amniotic fluid now what you are doing is you are just shaking this amniotic fluid now in this amniotic fluid if there is this surfactant what happened this surfactant is actually a lipid right so whenever you shake if bubbles are popping out if bubbles are coming out which means surfactant is present so shake test or bubble test which is also as a bedside test it can be uh, done to know whether the fetal lungs are matured or not if a shake test is positive fetal lungs are matured now nile blue sulfate test or skin test see the baby is present in the amniotic fluid the baby is shedding its cells okay the baby is shedding its epithelial cells into the amniotic fluid so what you have done by doing the amniocentesis you have collected the baby's epithelial cells now you have uh, segregated this baby's epithelial cells and what you are doing is you are putting this nile blue sulfate dye over it okay now whenever these cells whenever these cells are turning into orange color okay whenever more than 50 percent of the cells are turning into orange color it indicates that fetal lungs are matured now you can ask me sir how the fetal lung maturity is related to the epithelial cells of the baby now the surfactant is nothing but a lipid okay it's a lipid synthesis in happening in the liver not liver lungs lipid synthesis happening in the lungs now if lipid synthesis is happening in the lungs in the same way lipid synthesis is also happening in the epithelial cells so if lipid is here there can also be lipid in the epithelial cells now in fetal epithelial cells if lipid is present means then only the cells are going to turn into orange color okay that's the like you know total concept here so nile blue sulfate test you have done that where you are going to stay in the fetal epithelial cells if the fetal epithelial cells are turning into orange color it means this steroidogenesis or the lipid synthesis is happening in the fetal epithelial cells as well as the, as well as the fetal lungs that causes the lung maturity that indicates the lung maturity okay lamellar body count okay see this lamellar body count means like you know this surfactant is actually present in the lamellar bodies so by looking at the lamellar bodies also you can say that whether the surfactant is present or not now we have seen the test for the fetal lung maturity now let's discuss about the management of the preterm labor okay now right now there is this preterm labor now what to do now the main issue with the preterm labor is the non-development of the fetal lungs okay, or the immature fetal lungs now what as a doctor we can do for the management of preterm labor make the fetal lungs mature now how we can achieve that by giving the steroids okay by intravenous uh, route or intramuscular route we are going to give dexamethasone or betamethasone the two important drugs that's a dexamethasone and betamethasone if it's a dexamethasone the dosage is very important usually in india we use this okay dexamethasone uh, six milligrams every 12 hours four doses okay so dexamethasone in india what is the dose six milligrams we are giving six milligrams every 12 hour four times okay four doses we are giving now worldwide the drug given is a beta methasone for the fetal lung maturity how much we are giving it's we are giving 12 milligrams okay 12 milligrams every 24 hours just two doses okay worldwide this is being followed so steroids for the lung maturity now the question is for example uh, the preterm labor is happening now a female presented to you in the active phase okay now there is no time for you to give the steroids and these steroids it will take a lot of time almost one two days time for the like you know for their activity to happen 
now she present to you in active phase of labor right now she is in 34 weeks or uh, she is 33 weeks of period of gestation right now she is having preterm labor that too she is in active phase of labor now she is going to deliver the child now fetal lungs are not matured now what to do give the steroids postnatally so if a female present to you in preterm labor that to in active phase you can give steroids to her okay you can give steroids to the mother and those steroids are going to cause a fetal lung maturity also give postnatal steroids okay also give postnatal steroids if she is presented in the active phase of labor so that these postnatal steroids can also cause the fetal lungs to mature so artificial surfactants like you know can be given postnatally via intratracheal routes for example Cervanta okay it's a, a very popular uh, and most very it's a very costly thing okay which can cause the fetal lungs to mature postnatally okay now see uh, let's see a few important points now for this corticosteroids to function it almost take 24 hours okay and the maximum effects will be shown in two to seven days okay they will ask you you have given the steroids for them to work for them to start their work it takes almost 24 hours okay and the maximum effects are going to be for the maximum uh, their uh, function is going to be shown in two to seven days and if the preterm labor is because of chorioamnioritis right now she is having chorioamnioritis in this condition okay in chorioamnionitis condition steroids are contraindicated by because they can flare up the infection okay they can increase they can increase the infection okay so very important mcq in chorioamnionitis the contraindication there is a contraindication for the steroids okay very important now tocolysis let's talk a few important points about the tocolysis now a female present to you at 30 weeks of period of gestation or 31 weeks of period of gestation and now she is having uterine contractions then you can use the tocolysis okay then you can use tocolysis and you can give the steroids so that you are having enough time so that these steroids can act okay right now she is having tocolysis uh, she is having uterine contractions now she is going into labor now what you can do give tocolysis so that uterus is again getting relaxed now give steroids so that these steroids can act See the very important concept is here. If you are, if a, if a female is having preterm labor, if she is going to preterm labor, you can only pause it. You cannot completely stop the preterm labor. You can only get certain time so that the steroids can function. Okay, this is a very important concept that you cannot completely stop the preterm labor and you cannot continue the pregnancy till term. Okay, you are not you are not having that much time. You are only having two to three days of time so that you can only stop the preterm labor for two to three days. And that to these two to three days why you are waiting because you will be giving the corticosteroids so that these corticosteroids will mature the lungs okay so that's a very important point see these tocolytics are given before 34 weeks okay before 34 weeks after 34 weeks usually we won't give a tocolytics why because after 34 weeks actually the fetal lungs have started maturing so simply even after see the concept is very important even after 34 weeks we will give corticosteroids there is no doubt okay if there is preterm labor definitely we are going to give the corticosteroids but what i am saying before 34 weeks i am not using the tocolytics but i will use the corticosteroids even after 34 weeks that's a very important mcq okay so before 34 weeks i will use tocolysis after 34 weeks i won't use any tocolysis I will let the preterm labor to happen. I will induce the labor. Okay, I will induce the labor. I will deliver the baby after 34 weeks. But before 34 weeks, I am using tocolysis. Why I am using tocolysis? To continue the pregnancy till term? No. To get some time for the steroids to act. So I am also using, uh, before 34 weeks, I am using the corticosteroids also. Keep that point in mind. Now, tocolysis should only be used if cervical dilation is less than 6 centimeters okay see cervix is 3 centimeters dilated 4 centimeters dilated then you can use tocolytics but once the cervix is 6 centimeters dilated that is now she is in active phase of labor whenever she is in active phase of labor never ever give tocolytics right? because whatever you do she is going to deliver the baby tocolysis cannot act in the active stage of labor okay that's a very very important mcq okay so tocolysis given before 34 weeks very important mcq tocolysis only given before 6 centimeter cervical dilation 
and it should not be given after 6 cm dilation. Very important MCQ is should not be given in the active phase of labor. Whatever you do, if she is in active phase, she will deliver the baby. Okay. Now, this stocolysis, why you are giving this stocolysis before 34 weeks? Because it gives the time for the fetal lungs to mature. Okay, after 34 weeks, I am not using the tocolytics. I will be inducing the labor, I will deliver the baby by giving the corticosteroids. Okay. Now, let's see a few important tocolytic drugs. Okay, see. Now, beta agonist. Okay, beta agonist, we all know that alpha stimulation, alpha receptor stimulation will cause the contraction. Whenever you stimulate the beta receptors on the uterus, that causes the relaxation of the uterus. So, beta agonist, they will cause the relaxation of the uterus. And with this beta agonist, there are maximum maternal side effects will be seen. What are the maximum maternal side effects? What are these drugs? We will see in a minute. Okay. So, what are the examples of beta agonist? The only FDA approved drug that is ritodrine. Okay. Ritodrine is the only approved drug which is a beta agonist. Apart from that, salbutamol, isoxuprine can also be used. Okay. Salbutamol, isoxuprine, ritodrine, they are the beta agonist which can cause uterine relaxation, tocolysis. Now, what are the uh, side effects of these drugs. What are the side effects? I have said you maximum maternal side effects will, will be seen. The very important side effect is volume overload with the pulmonary edema. Okay, sodium retention, water retention will be seen. A pulmonary edema, volume overload will be seen. Okay, so a pulmonary edema because of sodium and water retention will be seen. Apart from that, very important side effect with these drugs is hyperglycemia. It causes the hyperglycemia uh, and also it will do lipolysis. Okay, lipid breakdown and it increases the blood levels of uh, sugar in the mother. So, beta agonists can cause tocolysis. Remember, tocolysis before 34 weeks. After 34 weeks, no tocolysis. You will induce the labor, you will deliver. You will, you will do the delivery. Okay. Now, let's talk about the calcium channel blocker. Now, the example of the calcium channel blocker is nifedipine. Okay, the very popular drug, the most effective drug, the safe drug. Okay, so widely used, very cheapest drug that we will usually use in the uh, clinics. Okay, so it's a best drug, it's a first line drug, and it's the most effective drug that's nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. I'm not saying it's the safest of safest. Okay, there is a one more uh, thing which is the safest drug, which is atoziban, which we will discuss later. But this is the best drug, which is widely available, cheaply available drug, which can cause the tocolysis. Now let's talk about calcium channel agonist. See, the example is magnesium sulfate, the very very important MCQ. It's not only a tocolytic drug; it also it is also a neuroprotective agent in the fetus. Okay, especially before 34 weeks, uh, we for uh, preterm labor management, we also add this. Okay, we'll discuss. Now, calcium agonist, the magnesium sulfate can be used and the side effects of this magnesium sulfate, if it is used for a lot of duration, if it is used for a lot of time, it causes hypocalcemia in the baby, okay. If it is used for more than uh, uh, 5 to 7 days, it causes fetal hypocalcemia. Whenever there is less calcium, that causes thinning of the fetal bones, that causes fractures. A lot of times, this question has been asked, fetal hypocalcemia is caused by which tocolytic agent? MgS44 magnesium sulfate. Now, this MgS44 is also a neuroprotective drug, okay. This drug is added for the management of preterm labor, especially before 34 weeks, okay. Now, oxytocin antagonist. We all know oxytocin is the one which causes the uterine contractions. Oxytocin antagonist means which causes the uterine relaxation. And what is that drug? It is atosiban, which is um, a very, very safest drug. It's the safest of all the uh, tocolytic agents and it's best in heart disease. Okay, if the mother is having heart disease, in that particular females, the drug of choice is going to be atosiban. Okay, drug of choice in a female who is having heart disease, atosiban. The safest of safest drug out of all the tocolytics is atosiban. Okay. Now, apart from that, let, let's also talk about the prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors. We all know that prostaglandins are the ones which cause the uterine contractions. Prostaglandin synthesis inhibition means tocolysis. And what is the example of the drug? It is indomethacine. Okay, indomethacine, even for the physiology, we have studied that. Indo using of indomethacine will cause premature closure. Premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. Why? Because ductus arteriosus is kept open by prostaglandins. Prostaglandin is kept open the ductus arteriosus. So, whenever you knock out the prostaglandin synthesis, whenever the prostaglandins are gone, the ductus arteriosus is going to be closed. Premature closure of ductus arteriosus. Apart from that, this endomethacin is very, uh, very important MCQ is 
causes a necrotizing enterocolitis okay it causes necrotizing enterocolitis it also causes uh, intraventricular hemorrhages okay very important mcq intraventricular it causes intraventricular intracerebral hemorrhages it it, it will cause okay now the large drug uh, which can cause the uterine relaxation or the smooth muscle relaxation is a nitric oxide patches okay nitric oxide patches in the form of a nitroglycerin we all know that nitric oxide is a smooth muscle relaxant right it's a vasodilator kind of effect it will show so nitric oxide usually this drug is not using these days okay this drug this nitric oxide is not using these days now please concentrate in the management of preterm labor have we used this progesterones no once if there is a preterm labor once the uterus is contracting progesterones are of no use we are not using progesterones once if there is preterm labor progesterones not used but progesterones are used to prevent the preterm labor okay so that's a very important mcq progesterone it is not used as a tocolytic agent it is the drug of choice for preventing the preterm labor see for preventing the preterm labor we have given the progesterones we have done the encerclage okay by 12 weeks that's the prevention this is management this is a treatment actually okay so progesterone we are not using for management of a preterm labor okay it's a drug of choice for preventing the preterm labor rather okay now let's talk about premature okay preterm premature rupture of membranes guys let me ask you one thing when actually the membrane should be ruptured the membrane should be ruptured when the cervix is completely dilated when the cervical dilation is completed at that time membrane should be ruptured okay what is premature rupture of membranes premature rupture of membranes means before full cervical dilation see i'm talking about prom premature rupture of membranes prom means rupture of membranes happening before full cervical dilation okay before full cervical dilation okay by 3 cm cervical dilation or 2 cm cervical dilation or 5 cm cervical dilation if the membranes are ruptured then it is premature rupture of membranes then what is preterm premature rupture of membranes preterm premature rupture of membrane means rupture of membranes have happened even before the onset of labor okay so rupture of membranes happened even before the onset of labor very important concept guys remember preterm labor is totally different it's a labor it's actually the uterine contractions now female is going into labor that is preterm labor this is a preterm premature rupture of membranes which means membranes are ruptured even before the labor okay even before the term so preterm means before 37 weeks before the onset of labor the membranes are ruptured okay so that is p prom okay preterm premature rupture of membranes now please concentrate here rupture of membranes before 37 weeks before the onset of a true labor pains okay but in preterm labor there is a true labor pains now she is going into labor okay now let's see how to diagnose that this is preterm premature rupture of membranes guys a very important mcq like you no know, very important concept is here a female by 33 weeks of period of gestation she came to you and she says you that now she is having vaginal discharge okay now her vagina is moist now you just done the post speculum examination her vagina is moist now it's having a little bit amount of fluid this moistness or this fluid might be because of premature rupture of membranes that the membranes are ruptured or this fluid can also be because of vaginitis we all studied that in vaginitis there is different types of discharges are there in candidiasis there is a different type of discharge in trichomon uh, trichomoniasis there is a different type of discharge in bacterial vaginosis there is a different type of discharge in chlamydiasis there is a different type of discharge so vaginitis during pregnancy can also cause discharge fluids that's coming out of the vagina and premature rupture of membranes can also cause fluid leaking out of the vagina so how to know whether the fluid which is coming out or the discharge which is coming out is actually an amniotic fluid or is it a just discharge because of vaginitis so we have to differentiate so you have to do certain test to confirm that the fluid which is coming out is actually an amniotic fluid so what are those test so the first important test a very important test and it's very important because every time this comes up in the exam that it's a nitrazine paper test okay nitrazine paper test now uh, please concentrate here 
this is image based question see this is actually the paper that's a nitrogen paper which is actually in the yellow color yellow color so you have to take the discharge and you have to uh, put it on the paper or just dip this paper into the discharge the concept here is if the fluid whatever it is coming out if the fluid is amniotic fluid we all know that amniotic fluid is alkaline in nature if the fluid whichever is coming out is amniotic fluid then the paper will turn into blue color see here the paper is turning into blue color which means the ph is alkaline ph the fluid is amniotic fluid if the amnio if the fluid whatever is coming out is amniotic fluid definitely it will be alkaline in nature if it is alkaline in nature our nitrogen paper will turn into blue color so very important mcq nitrazine paper test is done for a diagnosis of preterm premature rupture of membranes where if it is amniotic fluid the paper is going to turn into blue color because amniotic fluid is alkaline in nature and vaginal discharge the discharge is uh, because of vaginitis definitely the vaginal discharge is acidic in nature so the paper won't turn into blue color so this is how we will differentiate between amniotic fluid or the vaginal discharge okay now let's see a few important mcqs here guys a lot of times this questions has been asked sometimes you will get a false positive test when you will get a false positive test false positive test uh, can be because of a blood contamination why because we know the blood is an alkaline uh, fluid okay so because whenever the blood is getting contaminated with the fluids then the test will come positive or semen is also an alkaline thing whenever there is a semen contamination okay uh, this female had intercourse the previous day then this semen is still present in her uh, genital tract when the discharge is getting mixed with this semen it will come positive even though it is a vaginitic discharge when it is getting mixed with the semen it will come positive yes why because semen is a alkaline thing and during infections also this uh, nitrazine paper test will come false positive false positive and it will come false negative in the conditions of am oligohydramnios whenever there is oligohydramnios no fluid actually there is premature rupture okay preterm premature rupture have happened but because of oligohydramnios a very small amount of fluid is getting uh, like you know out that can give us a false results that's a false negative okay so this is one test to put the diagnosis of preterm premature rupture of membranes now please concentrate here we have discussed uh, these tests and fern test okay ferning we all know that the amniotic fluid okay amniotic fluid will show the ferning pattern this amniotic fluid because of that too much amount of estrogens under estrogenic effect there will be ferning okay now i will show you don't worry and nile blue sulfate test can be done to know whether the fluid is amniotic fluid or not same thing is the same concept right? because this amniotic fluid will be having fetal epithelial cells and whenever you do this nile blue sulfate test if it is coming positive which means the fluid is amniotic fluid right? because in the amniotic fluid the fetal epithelial cells will be there in vaginal discharge there are no fetal epithelial cells so phone test can be done nile blue sulfate test can be done nitrazine paper test can be done and amnesure it's just like you know it's a new advanced thing where you are going to have a strip okay where you are going to have a strip or, um, or, or a swab you are going to collect the discharge and you are going to everything is automated right so just like a pregnancy kind of strip so you are going to uh, put a drop of discharge over it if you are getting two two lines then it's positive so amnesure so these are the tests which can be done to put the diagnosis of preterm premature rupture of membranes here this is an image based question where you can see the ferning of the amniotic fluid if it is vaginal discharge there you will be seeing the beaded kind of appearance if it is amniotic fluid you will see the ferning pattern so what are the tests which are done to put the diagnosis of preterm premature rupture of membranes first important best test is nitrazine paper test where if it is amniotic fluid the paper will be turning into blue color fern test can be done if it is amniotic fluid you will see the ferning pattern if it is vaginitic discharge there you are going to see the beaded appearance nile blue sulfate test can be done amnesure can tell you whether it is amniotic fluid or not now let's talk about the management of preterm premature rupture of membranes the main problem here guys see with the preterm premature rupture of membranes the main problem is not just the fetal lung maturity when the fetal membranes are ruptured there is a lot of chance that the infections will go into the cavity and causes the infection so infection is a main issue here so before sorry in between the time of 34 to 37 weeks now what is the management before 34 weeks what is the management that we'll discuss now see after 34 weeks 
already fetal lungs have started maturation so in between this period after 34 weeks almost the baby is getting closer to the term now what we will do are we going to conserve the pregnancy are we going to continue the pregnancy no what we will do is we are going to induce the labor induce the labor do the delivery normal vaginal delivery induce the labor induce the labor do the normal vaginal delivery until unless if there is fetal distress or maternal distress okay so preterm premature rupture of membranes the main issue we are going to talk about is the is all about infection the babies might get infected so induce the labor also do the recto vaginal swab to know whether there is already infection if there is infection you can put the like you know you can give the antibiotics i should actually say do the recto vaginal swab before even coming the results prophylactic you know you have to start the antibiotic prophylaxis why because you know there is a risk of infection go with the recto vaginal swab there is no doubt but even before whatever the results start the prophylactic okay prophylactic gbs like you know uh, uh, gbs prophylax uh, prophylaxis what exactly is gbs group b streptococcus we know there is a risk of infection so we have started the antibiotics but for preterm labor have we started antibiotics no we will do the recto vaginal swab if it is coming positive then only we are starting the antibiotics there but here in preterm premature rupture of membranes we are giving the antibiotic prophylaxis okay now along with that steroids any any how before 37 weeks whatever is the case we can give the steroids there is no doubt okay before 37 weeks preterm labor or premature rupture of membranes we can start the steroids why because 100% lung maturation has haven't happened okay we can give the steroids so this is between 34 to 37 weeks now what's the issue before 34 weeks before 34 weeks it's a very early period now are you going to induce the labor now no we are not going to induce the labor now if there are uterine contractions you have to even stop those uterine contractions by giving the tocolytics okay see here in this particular area i am not using the tocolytics i want the labor to happen but before 34 weeks lungs are not matured now if there are uterine contractions means please concentrate if there are contractions means you can go with the tocolysis tocolysis now what we can do you can give the steroids okay so that the lungs will start maturing now before 34 weeks are you going to induce the labor and deliver the baby no before 34 weeks if everything is okay you can do the expectant management okay you are doing the expectant management uh, so that the hole will close where the rupture of membranes are going to heal and you are giving the tocolytic agents along with the corticosteroids see please concentrate here see you are giving steroids so that lungs will mature you know whenever there is a rupture of membrane there is a risk of infection so you are giving antibiotics along with that you are also doing the recto vaginal swab to know whether already any infection has happened so recto vaginal swab is done you have given the gbs prophylaxis you have given the steroids for the lung maturity to happen you are not inducing the labor you are not delivering the baby you are creating some time so that fetal lungs will be matured okay so you are going the expectant management i have said you before 34 weeks it's not only the lungs problem there is a risk of infection apart from that now before 34 weeks fetal like you know central nervous system is also not properly developed for that we are using magnesium sulfate why because this magnesium sulfate is a neuroprotective agent so before 34 weeks magnesium sulfate is also added okay for the neuroprotection so this is the management of preterm premature rupture of membranes hope the video is helpful thank you